Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in the drum series of webinars. This one, how marketers can become better project managers. My name is Justin Pierce from the drum. We're about to all, well a large proportion of the industry, to camp to the south of France for the Cannes Lion Festival where we celebrate the best and the most innovative of the work in the industry. But sometimes the focus on the front end, the creative brilliance of all the amazing campaigns our industry is producing, you forget about the, the back end, the really crucial building blocks that are fundamental to ad campaigns today. Ad campaigns that are getting more and more complex as, as digital itself moves faster and faster. And the behavior of consumers that digital both engenders and engenders speeds up. So project management. Project management is a key skill. And that's what we're looking at today. Project management is one of those areas that every marketer has to be aware of and will in some way impact every single one of the drummer's audience, but not everyone is as speed as they should be. So we've tied up with Workfront and we've got two amazing speakers that are going to go through today how to become a better project manager and most importantly, how to ensure that project management skills are embedded within yourself and your workforce. So we've got two great speakers today, Jada Ballister, marketing director at Workfront and our first speaker, Brent Bird, who's Director Solutions Marketing, also at Workfront. So without further ado, I'll hand over to them. But before I do, please ask questions. If you look at the screen in front of you, you'll see a little question box on the right hand side. Ask your questions throughout the next 45 minutes or so, and we'll get to the best of them towards the end of the webinar itself. So please enjoy yourself. And now I'll finally hand over to Brent Bird. Thank you, Brent. Thanks very much, Justin. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, uh, it's, it's great you take some time out of your day to uh, talk about what can be a, a, bo a boring subject, but it's very essential to uh, the building blocks of creative work, as Justin mentioned. So this is what we're going to be talking about today, is, is how to manage the common problems of marketing organizations simply through uh, u utilizing the skills that are required of, of project managers. So we're going to take the skills that project managers need to use and apply them to our marketing projects to ultimately be more effective. And then we're going to present uh, six easy steps so you can get better at managing projects starting today because most of them are, are actionable. You can, you can do them as soon as you're done listening to this webinar. So uh, even though uh, it may seem not the most exciting topic, I think we've got some things that can really help the work that you're doing uh, every single day. So we're glad that we can be here talking to you about it. So when you think about what marketers are asked to do, it kind of looks a little bit uh, like this. You're, you're expected to take uh, your great ideas, uh, you know, put them into a box and, and crank out uh, rainbows and unicorns and ultimately revenue. And that's often without having enough budget or resources to make these magical dreams uh, come true. Uh, also, uh, you know, deadlines uh, don't shift. We have constant deadlines that need to be met that, uh, that really never move. Uh, also, we have to do more with less and, and make sure that uh, we can handle an ever-increasing workload without losing our stuff while we still create these magical ideas that are going to ultimately contribute to the bottom line. Uh, and then when you look at uh, what the reality uh, of marketing project management looks like, when you look at you know, what does it take for us to actually get a, get a job done or get a project done, it really looks a lot like this, where uh, you can see there's, there's lots of, of disconnected tools that we use. Uh, we do a lot of walking from desk to desk to make sure that people are, are doing the right things. We meet a lot. We, we send a lot of emails. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, chaos and a lot of convoluted processes that take place in getting marketing work done. Uh, and so as, as sad as this, uh, as this diagram actually is, it's very representative of the work that it takes uh, to, to get a project uh, or, or a task off the ground in, in the marketing realm. So because of that, uh, there, there's definitely room for improvement and things that we could be doing better. So in this, uh, in this webinar, we're going to be talk, talking about four phases of project management and applying them to our marketing work. And uh, this is what we're going to be talking about right here. We're going to be talking about the intake process, where work comes to you, the planning process, what's that, what that's going to take to, to plan the project that you're doing, moving on to execution, and then ultimately fulfilling uh, the work that you're creating. So without further ado, let's get to the six steps of uh, marketing work management for product management. Okay, 
Um, so bearing in mind the four phases that Brent's just mentioned, um, as he said, today we're going to be talking about the six project management skills that every marketer needs to know. So we're going to start at the beginning. Um, and we're going to start with intake. So intake literally is, as it says, the process of receiving a work request along with its supporting documentation. But what we know it actually means is it is just any way in which someone is asking us to do something. So a couple of examples that you may be familiar with. Um, what does intake look now? Look like now? So we see a Slack feed. Uh, we've got phone calls, spreadsheets. Someone might just text you, send an email, drop by your desk. I'm sure many of us have this scenario on the bottom right on our phones. Um, it's just any way that someone asks us to do some work. And that comes in so many different formats. And as much as we try and standardize them, it's very easy to keep getting all of these requests in lots and lots of different ways. So the first skill that we think everyone needs to know is how to create an intake process that actually works. Um, working in, in the way we just saw, it's clearly not an efficient way to work. Um, so what we suggest is um, creating an in intake process that works using, using centralization. So the biggest benefit of centralizing your request management is really all around visibility. Um, so what you need to do is get a comprehensive view into the way uh, into the work you need, who's doing it, and then also what's coming up in a pipeline. So centralization will really streamline the request process for you. So it will make sure that nothing slips through the cracks and it will save you time with managing, assigning and tracking requests. And um, so here are a couple of examples of, of how you can do that. So centralizing your work request doesn't need to be difficult. It can be something really simple. Um, the most straightforward way to do it is something like an email inbox or a distribution list for any, um, for any request. So, for example, for us, it could be something like requests at workfront.com. Anytime anyone wants any work done, it has to go through that email address. Um, some other ideas for lower volume work is um, using either a shared folder or a Google Doc. Um, or for larger volumes of work where there's multiple teams involved, um, you can think about project management software. So I think one thing to remember is technology really can help. Um, we all hear a lot about MarTech and all of the new ways in which technology can help marketers. But honestly, sometimes software can get a really bad rap. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around how software can stifle creativity. But in my experience and lots of other marketers that I know and speak to regularly, it's quite the opposite. In reality, the right software can take away a lot of the pain of manual processes that we all know suck our time, and it can just give us back some time to do what we like doing, which is being creative and creating great work. Um, I think the thing to remember with this is whatever process you go with, you need to shout it from the rooftops. Spread the word. Um, if you go with an email inbox, just refuse anything that doesn't go through that email address. People will get the hang of it. And the other thing to remember is you will get pushed back. I know that this is going to be surprising, but not everyone likes change. Um, but you need to just hold firm. You need to tell the people the new process, and eventually they'll start doing it. The most important thing here, um, I believe, is just believing in your new process and holding really, really strong with it. Great. Thank you, Jada. I'll go, go to the next step, which uh, now that you've centralized everything uh, in your intake process, everything's coming to one place. To get a little more advanced, you can move on to the second step, which is use a request form for the work that's coming into you. Um, and as you can see, the request forms can really be your friend. They, they can really be something that can help you with, with the work that you're doing. Not only do they standardize the request process and make it very clear what people need to be entering when they make a request of your marketing team, uh, you're, you're controlling that information right up front so that uh, all the information you need to capture for each and every project that you're doing, uh, you can make sure that you get uh, right up there in the upfront piece. You can get all of your questions answered uh, so that they don't need to keep coming back and forth to you and saying, well, what about this? And I forgot to mention this aspect of it as well. And as we stated, it really needs to be mandatory. Uh, you know, for implementing a centralized request process or, or request forms, you may find that people are, are emailing you all the time or they're coming directly to your desk and asking you for things. 
really making it hard for you to get things done. Request forms can really help with that and really make it so that any request that comes into your marketing organization or to your marketing team is done in a very standardized way so that we can kind of get rid of that uh, uh, confusion of, of whether they need to go back and forth with you on that. Um, so how do you do it? How do you start using request forms? Well, you need to think of, a, uh, think of it as a creative brief or, or think of it as uh, you know, the map to the work that you're doing so you can get to your final destination. Uh, if you don't have a map, it's likely your team will get lost along the way. So you need to be as diligent as possible about capturing as much uh, information about the project as, as possible that's coming into your group. Uh, making sure you're defining the requirements, you're setting expectations right up front. Uh, you need to determine what information is really critical for you. Is that the, the, the specific specifications of their request? You know, what type of uh, asset are they asking for? You know, what, what, what else do you need to know to be able to do, do, your, do your job? And in doing so, you can really reduce the amount of rework and confusion about the work that you're doing and ultimately save you time and allow you to be more productive. Um, also, formalizing uh, a list of required elements and answers is a, is a great first start. And the more informal you make the form, the more room uh, that there is for inefficiency. So uh, make, make, sure that you, you make sure that you're standardized and that uh, the information you're asking for is, is uh, the same every single time. Also, there's another principle at work here that can really benefit you and make sure you're applying the, what we call the Goldilocks principle. Make sure you're not asking for, uh, for too much, you're not asking for too little, but you're asking for just, right, just the right amount of information to make sure you can get uh, your work done. Here's an example of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a work request within Workfront. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty short, pretty brief. And uh, normally what we're asking for is just the right amount of, of information to make sure we can get started on the project, but that we don't have any further questions uh, when it comes to uh, the work that's coming into us. So we want to know what they're asking for, maybe a description. How high of a priority is this thing? Is this something that needs to be done in the next day, in the next uh, couple of days, if, can it be a few weeks? And then if there's any, any other dimensions or specifications we need to know about, uh, they're all laid out right there on the form where we can, where we can easily see. And then lastly, much like uh, the spork, the most useful uh, utensil in the world, uh, we want to make sure that the form is useful for you as well. Uh, and it's very important that you, uh, you, you get the information that you need as an organization so that you can prioritize the work that needs to be done. And then you're really giving an opportunity for the customer to define their request on their own terms and giving them the opportunity to provide all the information that they have uh, so that they can streamline the process for you. Uh, so utilizing a request form is a, is a great way to do that and can really make things uh, easy for you to, to, to do so. So with that, let's move on to the plan phase. And in doing that, we're going to talk about the next thing, which is making the most uh, of your workflow. So most of you may know what it takes to get work done within your organization. You may know these are the things and the tasks that I need to do every single day when I come into work. But, but you, name, you may not know exactly what goes into the, the work that you're doing. And so the, the first uh, recommendation that I would give is, is make sure you start documenting your own workflow so that you know exactly what it takes to do the work within your organization. Now here's a really silly example, but uh, you think about when you build the taco, which is you know one of my favorite foods uh, ever. Uh, you know, I've I've always done it the very same way. You know, I've always uh, yeah do the do the meat first and then the lettuce on top and and so forth. And I do the cheese the very last. Well, I came across this, which is going to show me how to improve the taco eatability for maximum crunchability, which isn't even a word, but that's fine. I'm going to make it up right now. And by simply putting shredded cheese in the bottom of the of the shell and then everything on top. Uh, you can make sure that your taco is more crunchy than it would have been before. Hopefully, everyone knows what tacos are, hopefully. So essentially, the metaphor is know your own process so you can maximize it. Look at the steps of your own workflow so that you know exactly what needs to be done and where you can make improvements. And then you can also find out you know, what steps, steps your team goes through to complete the work so you can find out where you can be most efficient. And when you do that, you may come up with some surprises that maybe you didn't know. For example, here's a, here's a typical creative services workflow uh, just to get a job done, and, and, and this is very similar to what I showed at the beginning, but you can see to, to get something done uh, with a typical creative services team, it requires 14 steps and all sorts of different interactions with other departments. If you hadn't have documented this workflow, you may not have known, you know, these are the steps we need to take to do this, these are the people that we need to interact with, and, and these are the things and the, and the information that we need to collect to be most efficient. Uh, but when you see it all laid out and you've, and you've documented it, 
uh, you can see all the steps that need to happen and you can easily make sure you're doing the right things as you move through the work that you're doing. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, it also gives you the opportunity to prioritize because oftentimes projects aren't done in linear, linear order and uh, you really need to make sure that you're prioritizing in an effective way. Uh, as an example, uh, here's, here's something that I've done in my real life as a, as a marketer. Uh, as solutions marketing, we, we create a lot, a lot of the content that uh, you might see in the website or, or in the wild that talk about Workfront. And here's an example of an asset that we created, uh, the Complete Guide to Marketing Work Management. So to, to get this done, we mapped out our workflow. There's more than 23 different tasks to get this completed. Uh, it included writing, it included design and approvals. And just looking at that overall, it may have been easy to kind of get overwhelmed or to lose track of the process. So to make sure that we were being most effective and we were actually getting things done, um, we went ahead and broke that project into smaller chunks so that we could actually work on that. So. Um, so you can see that uh, this may be a little bit difficult to read, but you can see we did the concepting part first. We did the brainstorm, we did the outline, what, is, what should this be saying? And then we developed the copy and made sure that we had uh, all the rounds accounted for that would need to take place for approvals and things like that. And from that point, you can go to layout, you can go ahead and make a landing page, and then you can publish it uh, once that asset is completed and you've done all the work that's required to make that happen. Um, and so when you, when, you let, when you look at it that way and you can see all the key elements of the guide that needs to be done, uh, then you know, okay, well, we can, we can go ahead and do these very same things every single time we need to create an asset that's very similar. There's no need to reinvent the wheel every time you start a new job, especially when it's the kind that your creative team does all the time. So a great way to do that is to create templates as well uh, so that you can make sure you're, 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 not, you're not missing steps as you go through the process of making work. Uh, and you want to figure out exactly what works for your team. Uh, so if you were to do this in Workfront, for example, creating templates is very easy. You just take an actual project plan you save it as a template and so every time you're creating an asset or it's a TV spot or whatever it may be, you know that all of your steps are laid out for you and with predecessors and with uh, the amount of time it's going to take to do everything. So that's a, that's a great way to make sure that your priorities are straight because uh, you know, when you look at it, uh, our priorities, sometimes it's, it's hard to make sure we have the right thing in place. Like for example, we need to post to Facebook and Twitter that we had a baby before we even think about holding our, our newborn baby as well. So sometimes Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in, uh, in, in the wrong priorities. Jada, would you like to take this? Perfect. Um, so next up is all around creating schedules, um, but also actually sticking with those schedules. Um, it's so easy when we're asked how long it's going to take to do something, finger in the wind, uh, or probably a week, a couple of weeks, a couple of days. Um, but our advice is really around um, sticking to schedules and doing that by estimating key milestones. We find that really, really helps with, with planning out what that schedule is going to look like. Um, so don't go in blind. Think well in advance around, okay, what's the start date? When's the final version due? And then from that, what are the different milestones that we need to be thinking about? So when are the subtasks due? How many iterations have we agreed on? When are those iterations then due? Um, and when making those estimates, Try and work backwards from your final deadline and, and make sure that you include plenty of time for um, client, client reviews and those types of things. So think about um, how many days is it going to take them to approve each version. There's no point setting a schedule where you're expecting a turnaround from your client immediately, whether that be clients or your internal customers, um, and get them to acknowledge that they've got accountability for keeping the project on track. Um, and if they're delayed, then that's going to cause overall delays. I know that's a scenario that probably everyone on the phone has been in, um, that you're getting pushed and pushed and pushed to stick to a deadline, and then you send something over for approval and you're just waiting. So making sure that you're holding clients accountable is, is a really key part of that. And then develop a, um, a template to share with the clients that show every single task, when they're due, and who's responsible for its completion. Um, we find that having that documented schedule really keeps everyone accountable um, and lets everyone know what's expected at um, every step of the way. Okay, so the next step is all around execution. Um, so reviews and approvals, which is the bane of a lot of people's lives. So this is all about how to crush the re review and approval process. Um, so 
As you can see, um, this is taken from Workfront's state of work report. Um, more than a third of marketers say that delayed approvals make, up, um, make work late twice a week or more. I think that is probably underestimating, um, but that's up to 100 delayed projects for a team that delivers 1,000 projects or more each year. So delayed approvals is, is a huge issue for a lot of people. Reviews and approvals can be painful. Um, what we think that we need to, that everyone needs to be doing is setting expectations for the stakeholders at the beginning of the, the projects. Um, minimising approvers is a really, really key part of this, um, and establishing approval on SLAs. Um, so I spoke. I, I was at an event recently and spoke to someone who um, still has a job bag, a huge job bag that went round through 18 different people on their marketing department. They all had to sign off the piece of paper, and then the job bag will go to the next person, they'd sign it off, and it was taking weeks to get simple approvals done. Um, so one way to make your approval process a lot less painful is all around using digital approval. Um, I can honestly say digital, <laughs> digital approval has changed my working life. Um, the way in which to do this is to refuse to use anything that's, re refuse to approve anything that's not within the proofing tool. Um, so as you can see in the quote, today's marketing teams produce an average of 13 different kinds of content um, and marketing teams with a consolidated proofing tool that allows um, revisions of multiple content types saw a 56% improvement in speed to market. Um, so a project that would take four weeks before consolidation now takes fewer than two weeks. Um, so having everything all in a digital asset that everyone can contribute to, everyone can put their comments on, and then you have one final approver that signs it off, makes a massive difference to review and approval processes. Great. Thank you, Jada. So we're here at our, our last step, step number six, and that's uh, get your assets organized. Uh, because now that you've done, you've gone through the process, you've created something, uh, you've uh, You've, you've, you've had it done, uh, laid out and designed and all, all, the, all the other things. Where does it go at this point? And so some of the questions you need to ask yourself is, you know, when our content is final, uh, where, where does it go? Where do we store all of our final assets? Do we have one place where we keep everything? Do we have multiple places uh, where we keep things? Do we have a shared drive? Uh, are we storing things in, in the cloud? Is there cloud access? Uh, are they personal drives? Are they, are they distributed throughout our, our organization or is there they're one central repository where everything can get to the things they, they need to get to. And also, you know, how do you organize your assets? Are you, are you doing it by asset type? Are you doing it by audience or, or some other method? Uh, and do you have standard naming conventions or standards for files? So these are all questions you should be asking when you, when you think about your final deliverable to make them easily accessible when you actually need them. Uh, recommendation here is to make sure that you standardize, standardize, standardize on, on the things that you're doing once assets are final. You need to make sure that you have one place uh, for those assets that are completed uh, so that everyone knows this is where they go to get the assets. Uh, you know, th th we know these assets are approved. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can send them to customers. We can, we can send them to people and, and we're not going to get in trouble. We know that these are, are ready uh, to be consumed and to be uh, absorbed by customers. Uh, you also need to make sure that your naming conventions make sense so that everyone knows exactly the types of assets that they're looking for, that they're accessing, is the actual piece of content that they need to uh, to get their job done or to to send off to a customer or a prospect. And then you also need to figure out a, an organizational structure that everybody can use, uh, so that when they do access, you know, the shared drive or this cloud repository that you've got, they can they can easily find the things that they need um, and and make sure that they can uh, access files that are most important to them. And if you, if you haven't considered it, you might want to consider using a DAM or a digital asset management solution to make that easier. Because not only will you have one repository for all your information, you can have a, a naming convention that's consistent throughout your organization, but it will also allow you to easily search and find uh, assets and content using metadata, uh, using asset tags and different things like that. So you, you, can, you can find the information that you're looking for. So make sure that you do have uh, one spot for all your, all your final content. Um, oops, sorry about that. Lastly, you want to make sure that you, uh, you're measuring performance to, to figure out what works because obviously if you don't, if you don't know what's working, uh, you can't know that this is something that you need to repeat. 
so uh, keeping everything in one spot, you can see exactly the content that's being utilized most. You can see who's downloading things uh, more than others, and you can see what, what kind of content is being truly differentiating and being used out in the marketplace uh, through reporting or through other characteristics. So uh, when, you, when you measure performance, you're able to, to, to optimize the thing that you're doing and to make sure that you're being most effective, much like this baby here who's probably going to be very optimized because it's being fully measured and figuring out exactly how it works the best. So as you can see, there are many ways you can do that to make sure you're being, being most efficient. Thanks, Brent. Okay, so just to do a quick recap, um, the six project management skills that every marketer needs to know. So number one, as we said, is about creating an intake process that works. So centralizing is key. Um, choosing that process and holding firm is the most important thing. Uh, number two is all around using request forms. Um, so use those request forms as your creative brief. And remember the Goldilocks, princ the Goldilocks principle, so just enough information. Uh, number three, make the most of your workflow. Um, remember the order in which you make your taco. Sounds Doesn't sound as good without the American accent, but try and remember the tacos. Um, make sure that you prioritize accordingly and, and think about templates. The number four, schedules. So not just using schedules, but making sure that you stick with them and really making sure that you're holding everyone, including your clients, accountable. Number five, um, crushing review and approvals. So where possible, reduce your approvers, set SLAs, and think about online digital proofing. And then for number six, getting your assets organized. So standardize, 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 um, just making sure everything's stored in one place, and make sure you're thinking about naming conventions, and then finally considering a digital asset management. Great. Thank you, Jada. So now I believe we've got uh, some time for uh, Q&A as well, but also before we leave you, we want to make sure that you are able to uh, have additional assets to make sure you can, you can completely manage uh, your work uh, from a marketing perspective. If you'd like to get a demo of Workfront for marketing teams, uh, here's a link to do that. If you'd like to see the guide that I mentioned earlier about uh, the complete guide to marketing work management, uh, here's a link where you can access that. And if you do have additional questions, you can also email us at the uh, email address there. But I believe now we'd like to get to, uh, to your questions. Brent, thank you very much. And Jada, fascinating presentation, full of insight all the way through. Uh, as expected, we've had questions pouring in throughout your presentation. But there's still time to get your questions to either of our presenters or indeed both. Uh, so as I said at the start, there's a question box on the right-hand side of your screen. So any more questions you've been saving up, put them in there. Put them in there now, and I'll try and get to them. So first of all, uh, this is to either of you. This is from Charlie. He says, what advice do you have for delays caused by external suppliers not meeting the deadlines you set them? Uh, that, that's a great question. I'll take that one first. Uh, I, I think a, a great way to counter that, at, work, at Workfront, we work with a lot of external suppliers, a lot of external vendors. Uh, to get the jobs done that we need to do. And, and oftentimes we've run into uh, this scenario where we are waiting on them uh, to provide something so that we can, so we can complete our work. And it can be very difficult. Uh, one thing that I have found that, that really helps is uh, allowing them to communicate with you in context of the work uh, that you're doing. So obviously we use uh, you know, work management software to, to get our work done. We have everything broken up into chunks uh, in that work management software. So say, for example, if I'm going to be outsourcing the design component uh, of an asset and I want to have an external vendor do that for me, uh, I'm going to send that request to them through our work management software. And uh, I'm going to be able to comment within that that these are the, this is when I need it done and this is how I need it done. Uh, and then I, I, can, I can simply make sure that I'm continuing to keep that line of communication open in doing so. I've also done other things where we don't involve our own software where I simply need to send them an email or I'm, I'm doing a phone call or a kickoff meeting in that way. And I have found that clearly stating your objectives up front and clearly letting them know that you are reliant on them to complete this project really seems to help with their uh, ability to, to, to make things happen for you. And, and, and if, uh, you know, if they can really understand that you know, your project is really relying on them, uh, oftentimes that helps with responsiveness. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. Fantastic. And I think just to add to that, 
So when you, when you are setting out your schedule from the beginning, um, you're communicating it with everyone involved. If there are delays and if you're waiting for people to come back with uh, to you with approvals or something like that, I alter the dates on the schedule to show how those approvals have impact how the late approvals have impacted it, and resend that out and say, understand that. Um, we haven't got this back yet. Just want to let you know if we get this tomorrow, this is that this is going to be the, the the end date now. If we get this the day after, this will be the end date now, and and make them realise up front that that their delays are causing an impact. Exactly, great insight. Excellent, great answers. Okay, there's a question here from Rachel, and she said uh, you talked about sharing schedules with clients to make everything easier. What are your best tips on how to do this? So I guess what she's looking for here is tips on technology or techniques to actually sh share these with clients. Um, so I think that probably follows on quite nicely from the last question. So the way that we do it ourselves is within the work management um, within the work management software. So we use our our own product across the whole of the marketing team, and we have all of our agencies and everyone that we work with um, into that. So. For us, it's it's quite simple because on every project, there's a number of tasks that are assigned to those people with deadlines, and they can see that as the deadlines shift, um, then the end result of the, the the due date then shifts as well. Um, so if you've got the if you have um, software that can help you with that, that makes it keeps it really really simple. Um, and I think otherwise, you know, it, depending how big the projects are, um, it can be as simple as doing it over email and just having. Um, that centralized email address that everyone uses or it can be using a spreadsheet superb okay another Brent any uh, thoughts from you on that I uh, know I just uh, completely agree that's exactly how I manage my work as well oftentimes uh, I have had to try to even attempt to share calendars sometimes uh, if we're not using uh, one consolidated software piece sometimes sharing a calendar can help because then everyone can see the dates uh, as well and that seems to make it more effective also if you don't have a consolidated software solution that you're using. Fantastic. Okay, there's a question here sort of digging into, I guess, a bit more about the, the actual tools. This is from Louise, and she says, how do the approvals work on the digital proofing tool? And that's, again, out to either of you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. So uh, it's, it's actually quite simple uh, on the proofing tool managing approvals. Once once you get uh, an asset uh, and you've created a, a digital proof of it, uh, you can you can send it out to different people for review or you can actually uh, uh, denote you'd like one person to approve it. And you simply click a box or, or tick a box and you can send that asset to them and they can see that their approval is being requested. And then instead of uh, having to download the file or do anything like that, they can simply pull up a digital proof of that online so they can see exactly how the asset is going to be looking uh, in, a, in a full rendering of, of how it should look, and then they can they can quickly make comments in context of the asset itself. Uh, for example, if they don't like the cover, they don't like uh, the way that it's laid out, or if they have uh, comments on the actual uh, assets, for example, they can uh, they can note that on the asset itself and, and make those changes there. Uh, so it's actually quite easy. Fantastic. Okay, uh, there's a question here from Steve, and he says. You talked early on about spreading the word, uh, getting buy-in, I guess, for these new processes. He says, what's the advantage and do you have any tips for getting senior level management buy-in? Yeah, so um, absolutely getting senior level buy-in to this is really, really important. Um, and what we can do, um, we can provide, there's a, a report that Workfront did um, called The State of Work, um, which where we went and interviewed lots of different uh, marketers and, and looked at the impact that that has on work. And there was, there's some really good numbers in there around the importance of centralizing work, consolidating work. So a lot of figures that can help people get that senior buy-in so that people, so they can understand why you want to centralize this work. It's not that you're just being a pain and you are just sick of getting people dropping by your desk it actually really makes a difference to the business the amount of work that you can get done the quality of the work the lack of reworks and um, so there's a lot of business justification around centralizing that work so making sure that senior management really understand the reasoning behind it um, and then getting them to help you communicate that message is really important 
And I also think an aspect of that uh, that, that wasn't mentioned is, is visibility as well. When you think about uh, all the lists of work of things that we need to do, oftentimes how many things do we forget about or do we neglect to do because maybe it fell down to the bottom of our list, for example. So I think when you've got all your requests coming into one place, it's very easy to see. Here's all the work that we need to do. It's all in one spot. We're not going to forget anything. And I think that's a very compelling message uh, for senior management as well, is they know the work's actually going to get done and there won't be any, any gaps in delivery. Excellent. Thank you both. Just a quick reminder to our audience, you can still get your questions in. We've got the dying hours of this webinar, but on your screen, the right-hand side, question box, put some in there and I'll try and get to it. So now uh, I've got a brilliant question here from Cam. Uh, and they say, when briefing ex external or indeed internal suppliers, what tips do you have for making sure you get what you're expected? And they say, short or long brief, what works best in, in your experience? So I, I think using using a request form really is the key. So as Brent alluded to earlier, using that request form as your creative brief, um, and not just thinking, okay, this is this is a form that people use to to just send over the basic information, and then I'll I'll drop an email, or then I'll have a phone call, or have a meeting. Uh, making sure those request form forms are used as a briefing tool um, is really really important. And again, not too much information and not too little information. So the, the quantity within that is really important. Great. Brendan, any thoughts on that? I would, I would agree. I, I've, I've tried both. I, I've been, uh, I started my career in advertising and, and had to deal with the four and five page creative briefs where you, you know, delve into, into everything, every single aspect of, of the market that you're talking to and the audience that you're talking to and have found that, that even using a, a really long creative brief is, is often not as effective as using one that's, that's just asking for the right amount of information. So here, here in the work that I do, I've found that you know, just asking uh, for, I, I don't know, it could even be five to, five to eight questions to get all the information that you need seems to be most effective. Uh, not only will you get people to uh, be encouraged to fill it out, but then they can also provide all the information that's relevant right up front so that you don't have to go back to them. Uh, for that. And then if they need to attach any supporting documentation, they can. Uh, any imagery that they think would be a good fit, uh, they can do that as well be because you're not asking for uh, a lot of information that they that makes us so they don't want to uh, fill out that form. Fantastic. Uh, quick question here from Rochelle. She just she, she said she loved the slide on the chaotic processes uh, that entails, which I like. But she asked, will the presentation be shared and this is just out to everyone but yes following this webinar we'll be sending out the recording of the webinar to everyone that's that's registered so don't worry that's coming your way very soon so digging in now to a question that i have from gordon and this is more so i guess it's about workfront itself uh he asks how configurable is workfront most importantly can i customize it to my workflow that's again to either of you and I'll take that one first, and the, the answer is absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely customizable, and you can, you can alter or edit, uh, edit it to fit your, your exact workflow and whatever works the best. In fact, most of our customers aren't using the same implementation. A lot of them are, are using uh, implementations that are very custom for the work that they do. Obviously, a marketing department is going to have different needs than an IT provider or a solutions implementation team, and so it is completely configurable to work that you're doing. Fantastic. I've got a question here from, from Nicole. Uh, she asks, well, she actually asks, does work for, work on your on your phone? But I'd like to extend it out a bit and get you both your thoughts on, on the place of mobile devices within Project Manage and what you're seeing, what you're seeing changing. Yeah, so I guess first of all, the short answer is um, yes. <laughs> to um, Cole's question. Um, so we have an app which we use um, for work on the go and you know, the way I see it is you can't, you can't do work just in one place anymore. You need to be able to do work on the go. No one is just sat in an office you know, all day every day with no kind of movement around. So um, having the ability to work from anywhere, to work while you're out and about, um, to be able to respond quickly, to be able to make approvals quickly, um, to be able to proof comments on approvals 
um, it's really, really important. And I think that that's just going to be um, something that we see more and more um, over the coming years. And I would agree with that. I, uh, I'm not quite, I'm a little bit older than a millennial, uh, <laughs> but I deal, I deal with them every day. And uh, it, it's been a transition for me to kind of uh, do everything on the mobile device, but I'm, I find that, that uh, I do more and more uh, on, on the phone than I, than I ever would on the laptop. And so I, I do find that uh, I, I also need to do work anywhere and being able, being able to do that from a mobile device really makes a difference because, you know, while you're at lunch, you can, you can simply make a, a simple approval or you can make a comment on something and uh, even be productive even when you're, when you're out of the office. So totally agree. Thank you very much. Okay, there's one here from Ali. Uh, he asks, I guess it's a he, who or she asks, how do uh, PM tools and systems like Workfront allow and enable access for external clients and vendors? Um, so we personally, um, with Workfront, we use it, as I mentioned, across the whole de department, and we have um, our, all of our external creative agencies, vendors, our PR agency, um, everyone uses that with us. So it's just a case of um, signing them a license and then we communicate internally and externally um, throughout Workfront. So any requests, any jobs we're working on um, all get done through the tool uh, and it just keeps everything in one central place. It means that no one's going to miss or lose emails. Um, it, it just keeps everything really, really nice and clean. Great. And Brent, any thoughts to add last year there? Um, yeah, I, I do think uh, being able to, uh, to use a, a project management software really, really does make a, a huge difference in the work that you're doing because, you know, everything, uh, as Jada mentioned, is, is all in one place. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing. I, I found that when we get requests from, from other uh, departments in, in past lives at, at other places of work, it's, it's been very disconnected. I've, I've been, been interrupted you know, uh, all, all, all number of ways where people come up and ask me to do things for them. And being able to consolidate that in one place has, has really been uh, a game changer and has really helped with things. Superb. Okay, we're coming to the end of time. So I'm going to take this last question from Melanie, mostly because I like the way she said she loves the taco example. I, I did too. Uh, she says, are these templates easy to get? And I guess what she means here, translating a bit, is, can you go and download these online easy or or can you find them in any central resource, or do you have to develop your own bespoke templates? What are your tips there? Uh, as far as Workfront is concerned, uh, once, once you determine what your project template looks like, then you're able to save that as a template in the work that you're doing. We actually have an asset uh, available where we give, uh, I believe, 10, 10 different uh, marketing template structures uh, if, if I'm mistaken, we give you some ideas of how you can structure your work uh, with, with some with my ideas and give you some, some examples of, of templates. And uh, I, I can make that asset available to you uh, as well after the fact. We can get your contact information. But it's very simple to do within within Word and very simple to figure out the way that you're working and to save that for figuring as a template, yes. Superb. Uh, I'm going to end with one last question here. It's from Dan. He says... I work as an SME, but my work is just as complex as the bigger guys, exclamation mark. What sort of tips do you have for me? I guess there he's alluded to the fact that he may have budget constraints, he may not be able to get senior management buy-in, but what, what tips have you got for, for SMEs? So, I mean, I think all of this applies. So we obviously gave some examples from um, you know, using one email address through to having project management software. But I think, you know, a lot of the same concepts apply. So if you, um, if you look back at the six kind of tips that we gave, they're all still completely relevant, regardless of what size business or um, for companies who need to manage projects. Getting, um, getting consistency, spreading the word, making sure that you are strong in, in the new process that, is that you put in place, getting just the right amount of information. This, this is relevant for every size of organization, every size of creative team, and regardless of the amount of projects, because we all know, you know, even a small amount of projects can be extremely complex. 